Stanford University. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We'll get started. Uh, my name is Sig Hecker. I'm the co-director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation, uh, known as CSAC, at the Freeman Spogli Institute here at Stanford University. CSAC is Stanford's research center committed to rigorous scholarship and intellectual exchange. Its mission is to build a safer world by focusing on a wide range of issues from nuclear nonproliferation and nuclear policy to cyber and biosecurity, terrorism, migration, and transnational flows. On behalf uh, of my CSAC co-director, Tino Cuellar, uh, and myself, I'm delighted to welcome you to the annual Drell Lecture. We're especially honored uh, to have worked with the Brookings Institution and the Plowshares Fund to commemorate and to reflect upon the incredible sequence of events of the Cuban Missile Crisis 50 years ago. We're streaming this event on Ustream, so I want to extend a warm welcome to our global online audience as well. Past speakers in the Drell Lecture have included Mohamed El Baradei, the former Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, astronaut and former CSAC Science Fellow Sally Ride, who unfortunately passed away this past summer. Uh, and Dr. Peggy Hamburg, now Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, former Secretary of State George Schultz, and Sid Drell himself, as well as last year, Dr. Rose Gattermiller, who's now acting Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. Before I welcome our panelists this afternoon, I'd like to extend a deep thanks to Albert Bud Whelan and his wife, Cicely, who generously established the annual Durrell Lecture in 1994 to address critical national or international security issues that have important scientific and technical components. Their gift was intended to bring new perspectives to security issues. It has done so, and we're grateful to them for that. Unfortunately, they could not be here with us this afternoon. I'd like to extend special welcome to Sid Drell, for whom this lecture is named, and his wife Harriet, uh, to be here today. Sid is the founding co-director of CSAC and also a former deputy director of the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. And he's been advisor to US presidents uh, over the past 50 plus years on matters of international security. We're truly honored uh, to have him as a friend of CSAC and to have him and Harriet here this afternoon. Now, before introducing our panel moderator, Joe Serencioni, who will in turn introduce this distinguished panel, I want to tell you about a couple of anecdotes uh, from two of the participants uh, in, in the Cuban Missile Crisis days 50 years ago. And the two are Bud Whelan himself uh, and our own CSAC's own William J. Perry. Unfortunately, neither one of them could be here tonight, so you're going to have to take these anecdotes secondhand from what they told me. Just to set the stage, Bud Whelan uh, was uh, asked by CIA Director John McCone to lead the uh, agency's Office of Scientific Intelligence in the summer of 1962, just as the Soviets were actually marshalling the missiles uh, into Cuba. Uh, he was leading the analytical work on missile space and nuclear issues. He also headed the interagency group called GMAIC that reviewed intelligence on missile and space programs for the US Intelligence Board. Bill Perry at the time was working at Sylvania's Electronic Defense Laboratories uh, out here in Mountain View, California. Uh, he was a Stanford undergraduate classmate of Bud Whelan's, the class of 1949. And he had worked with Whelan on several government committees during Bud's tenure at TRW. Bill Perry tells the story in our class, which is the role of technology in national security, and we have a number of our students here today. He says, Bud Whelan called me in October uh, of 1962 and asked me to come back to Washington to consult with him on a technical problem. And I said, sure, uh, I will rearrange my schedule 
and I'll be back there next week. And he replied, you don't understand. I need to talk to you right away. So Bill says, I took the red eye and met with him the following morning, and I was stunned when he showed me the U-2 pictures of the Soviet missile deployment underway at Cuba. And Bill uh, was a master analyst at that time. For the next 10 days, Bill says, I was part of a small team that worked every night at the National Photographic Interpretation Center, NPIC, studying the latest technical intelligence available so that President Kenny had the be benefit of this analysis the following morning. As a result, each day that I went to our analysis center, I believed could well be the last day on earth for me. Each afternoon, I called home to talk to my wife and my children. Bud Whelan told me several stories within the past couple of weeks of his time uh, during this crisis. Uh, and he typically was the technical specialist that was brought along to brief President Kennedy. Now, now mind you, as you can do the math, you know, both uh, of these esteemed gentlemen, Bud Whelan uh, and Bill Perry, were all of 35 years old uh, at that time. And, and so on one of these morning briefings with the president, uh, after they had become convinced, and particularly he, Bud Whelan, uh, and McCone, uh, the uh, director of the CIA, that the Soviets did indeed have nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba. Uh, they had highly classified uh, field manuals with them at the time in the White House, uh, and Bud told me I hadn't slept for days. I was absolutely dead tired, uh, but they briefed the president, and the president asked, so how many days do I have left, in essence, before uh, he would uh, have to take action on this critical situation. And Bud said, three. He said, the president turned to him and he said, are you sure? And Bud replied, you bet your ass. <laughs> and then immediately followed, I said, so I'm terribly sorry, Mr. President, I'm so damn tired. The president said, it's okay. I am betting my ass. So we'll hear today that he was betting more than that. <laughs> he was betting at least his country and maybe the world as we know it today. So I'd like to now introduce Joe Cirincioni, our distinguished moderator, who's been trying to get the world's attention to highlight the dangers of nuclear weapons. He's a leading voice in the international security arena. He's the author of two books one called Bomb Scare, The History and Future of Nuclear Weapons, and the second, Deadly Arsenals, Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Threats. His commentary has been featured in the New York Times, on CBS News, PBS, uh, and a multitude of major media outlets around the world. I would say essentially anybody that's been willing to listen, <laughs> uh, Joe has been trying to tell. Joe is currently the president of the Plowshares Fund, a foundation dedicated to global security He's a member of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's International Security Advisory Board and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. We have a terrific cast of panelists uh, that Joe will introduce, and I'm sure this will be a lively discussion. Before I turn the floor over to Joe, I will just ask you to hold your questions until the end of the talk when Joe will moderate a question and answer session. So it's with enormous pleasure that I ask you now to help me welcome Joe Cirincione. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hecker. That's terrific. Thank you very much. And before we proceed, I just wanted to say how fortunate we are to have Stanford University hosting us today and to have in the audience former Secretary of State George Schultz, Schultz and current uh, Assistant Secretary of State Tom Countryman. Please join me in thanking them for their years of service current, present, and future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have an all-star panel here to discuss this issue with us. And our, our first hitter up is David Holloway, who is a leading historian on military history of Russia and the Soviet Union. He's a professor of international history here at Stanford University and a fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. He's the author of Stalin and the Bomb, one of the books that I relied on in doing my research, the story of how the Soviet Union built 
the, uh, their first nuclear bomb. It was cited by the New York Times Book Review as one of the 11 best books of 1994. It's been published in six languages. We're very fortunate to have David here with his insights into the Soviet side of this crisis. Uh, next in the batting order is Scott Sagan, a professor of political science here at Stanford University and a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute and at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. He was formerly the co-director of CSAC from 1998 to 2011. Anyone who's taken a class in international policy or nuclear policy has probably read one of Scott's many books. I require my students to read it, particularly his debate with Kenneth Waltz, The Spread of Nuclear Weapons, a debate renewed. Interestingly, and we'll hear more about this, 10 years ago, he was in Havana, Cuba for the 40th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, a conference that was attended by Fidel Castro and Robert McNamara. And finally, in our batting order is the former Deputy Secretary of State, Strobe Talbot, whose career spans the highest levels of journalism, government service, and academia. He's been the president of the Brookings Institution since 2002 and is widely recognized as an authority on global governance, nuclear arms control, and U.S. foreign policy. And particularly important for our purposes, he edited and translated the audio recorded memoirs of Nikita Khrushchev into English entitled Khrushchev Remembers. So let's get started. It was 50 years ago tonight at this very hour when the young president of the United States came on television, on all the channels, and told the American public that the United States had discovered that there were nuclear-capable missiles deployed in Cuba by the Soviet Union. I was, one of those, I was a young kid watching that at the time. In the days that followed, my family, like many others around the United States, started storing bottles and jugs of water, starting putting few food supplies aside, and as the days ticked off, we all feared this was it, the worst was about to happen. The crisis had started, we now know, about five months earlier when Nikita Khrushchev was in Bulgaria and he decided to put those missiles in Cuba. David, what was he thinking? It's <laughs> a good question, but before I answer it, I have to, I cannot not say how pleased I am and honored to be part of the Drell Lecture. I've worked with Sid for nearly 30 years and have the highest admiration, so I'm, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. Um, there's still controversy about what Khrushchev had in mind. The first thing to note is that it was his idea to put the missiles in Cuba. Um, there had been a request from the Cuban government, the revolutionary government, to um, for military assistance to Cuba to help protect Cuba against um, a possible American invasion. But it was uh, Khrushchev, apparently on this holiday or on this visit to Bulgaria, I shouldn't say holiday, on this visit to Bulgaria, he thought, well, the US has uh, recently deployed uh, medium range missiles in Turkey. Why can't we do the same thing in uh, Cuba? Turkey borders on the Soviet Union, so why don't we have a chance to put our missiles into Cuba? He uh, um, brought that up with the Politburo. Uh, there were some doubts, but the style of decision-making was such that it was extremely difficult for anyone to uh, uh, say more than, oh, I, I, have you considered this possibility? It was very difficult for anyone to speak out openly. Uh, the military planned uh, an operation and the task that they were given was to provide defense against uh, possible American uh, attack or invasion of Cuba. And they decided to send over 40,000 troops along with um, a number of medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles, as well as, and this was not known by the US at the time, as well as um, over, uh, about 100 tactical nuclear weapons as well. So that's one explanation, and most Russian authors say this was the goal, was to provide defense of Cuba, that 
the Soviet leadership, after so many years uh, uh, since their own revolution, were totally taken with the young revolutionaries in Cuba. Fidel and Che Guevara were, romant were heroes to them, heroes representing, I think, a past that they themselves had long moved past. And I think this was a great attraction. However, it's not the only reason, I think. Uh, if you think about Khrushchev, um, he liked to quote uh, a statement that Lenin quoted from Napoleon, which was, on s'engage et puis on voit. You get stuck in and then see what happens. I mean, engage and then see. And um, I think that was very much Khrushchev's style. Uh, as he put it in another uh, more homely expression, he explained to uh, some of his uh, military commanders, we want to put a hedgehog down the American pants. <laughs> and therefore, it's very hard to say that, yes, he thought this maneuver would lead to um, uh, enable him to um, get the Western powers out of Berlin, or this maneuver would uh, help him in his relations with China by showing that he really was revolutionary. I think it's true to say he was someone who did believe, yes, let's do something, and you know, something good can then can then come of this. And the plan was to do it secretly. And to, uh, after the, all the missiles had been deployed, to go to Washington or maybe to Havana and announce that there was a treaty between Cuba and the Soviet Union for defense and that under this treaty, these weapons had been deployed in Cuba. Okay, let's, let's pick up the US side. So in September, President Kennedy warns that if Cuba, if Russia were to do this, the gravest issues would arise. On October 14th, an American U-2 takes surveillance photos of Cuba, and Kennedy knows, in fact, there are now at least missile parts on the Cuban I I island. What's Kennedy thinking at this point? Richard, let me both say that it's a real honor to be here as well. I've been on the other side of the podium uh, announcing people uh, uh, at this event. It's a real honor for me to be here honoring Sid Drell and what he's done. Um, on September, as you note, President Kennedy said the gravest issues would arise. And on September 13th, he said, I have indicated that if Cuba should possess a capacity to carry out offensive action against the United States, the United States would act. Now, what he didn't know when he was making what he thought was a, a red line deterrent yeah, yeah. threat was that the Russians had not only made the decision, but things were already arriving. Indeed, the first warheads arrived for the tactical weapons and the medium range on October 4th. So he's told about this afterwards, and he's reassured on September 15th by a statement that the Soviets made, and I quote here, that the armaments and military equipment sent to Cuba are designed exclusively for defensive purposes and there's no need for the Soviet government to shift its weapons for the retaliatory blow to any country, for instance, to Cuba. So his anger at being deceived, in a sense that his credibility now is on the line, comes forward when he's told that there are missiles in Cuba, although he doesn't know yet that there are warheads there, and he has to act very quickly. Um, looking at Cuba... I believe he saw Berlin in his nightmares. Because mm -hmm. he knew that Berlin was going to come up after the elections, and the United States was relying upon our extended nuclear deterrent guarantee to the Germans to try to dissuade the Russians. His sense that if the United States does not act over Cuba, even at some risk of war, the likelihood of war later, as soon as November, would actually be increased. He felt that he had little choice. And indeed, we now have the tapes from the Executive Committee of the National Security Council. And I thought I would just close this initial comment by reading two Good. notes about them. JFK says on October 16th, 
Last month, I said we weren't going to allow it. Last month, I should have said that we don't care. But when we said we're not going to do it, and then they go ahead and do that, and then we do nothing, I think our risks would increase. And General Maxwell Taylor, meeting with Kennedy that on the 19th, says, I think we'd be unanimous in saying that really our strength in Berlin, our strength anywhere in the world, is the credibility of our response under certain conditions. And if we don't respond here in Cuba, I think the credibility is sacrificed. And Kennedy says, that's right. That's right. That's why we've got to respond. So Taylor colloquially puts it, we've got three options. We can either shoot them out, have an air attack, 700 sorties for five days, potentially followed up with an invasion. We can trade them out, offer the missiles, Jupiter missiles in Turkey in a public exchange, or we can squeeze them out, he says. Use coercive diplomacy, create a quarantine or a blockade, and tell them that worse will come if you don't withdraw the missiles. Well, even though the majority of his advisors initially favor the airstrike and the Joint Chiefs continue to favor it, Kennedy chooses the third option. And on October 22nd, as you, admit, as you noted, has a quarantine but keeps the other two options open both preparing for a potential attack and secretly preparing for a potential missile deal, trading our missiles in Turkey. He does not want to do that, and he definitely does not want to have an airstrike and invasion. But he starts the quarantine to, as Taylor put it, to try to squeeze them out. Yeah. I'm going to come to Strobe in just a minute, but let me just dig a little deeper into this. How serious did both leaders think the crisis was at the time? How, how seriously did Khrushchev take this? Oh, they <clears throat> thought it was extremely serious. We have the Politburo minutes for the 22nd of October. They hear that Kennedy is about to give a speech, so they meet and they guess from their own intelligence that it's going to be about Cuba. And they're afraid that what Kennedy is going to do is to announce an attack yeah. on, on Cuba. And um, let me just quote a few words from Khrushchev's uh, response. He says, the thing is that we don't want to start a war. We wanted to frighten them, to uh, constrain or deter the United States with respect to Cuba. And then he says, it's tragic. They could attack and we will respond, and it could turn into a big war. And how serious does the American side take this? What do they think the stakes deadly, are? Deadly serious. Yeah. He thought, Kennedy later said he thought the chances of war were between one-third and one-half, but he also thought, as I noted, and that by we war, don't do anything. And by war, we mean? Potentially nuclear war. Global, a global nuclear exchange. Certainly that could happen, or it could be a, a nuclear attack just in Cuba. Okay, so that's but the, he gets scared. One thing that he does that helps him, I think, decide on the quarantine is he has two speeches written for today. The quarantine speech, and only recently has the second speech announcing an attack been declassified. And let me read you yeah. two paragraphs, or half a paragraph. My fellow Americans, with a heavy heart and a necessary fulfillment of my oath of office, I have ordered and the United States Air Force has now carried out military operations with conventional weapons only to remove a major nuclear weapons buildup on the soil of Cuba. Further military action has been authorized to ensure that this threat is fully removed and not restored. And he concludes, the United States need not and cannot tolerate defiance, deception, and offensive threats on the part of any nation, large or small. Nuclear weapons are so destructive and ballistic missiles are so swift their sudden shift in the nature of their threat can, deep be, can be deeply dangerous, especially when the trigger appears to be in the hand of a violent and unstable revolutionary leader. Okay, and now, in fact, only in the last 10 or, or so years have we discovered that the crisis was even worse than we thought, that we now know that there were 158 nuclear weapons in and around Cuba, some of these ready to use on medium-range SS-4 missiles 
that could reach Washington and all points south. And we did not know that at the time. Do you have anything else to add to this, David, about how much more serious the crisis actually was than we knew, than either leader knew at the time, or at least that the United States knew at the time? No, it was uh, extremely serious. I mean, at the beginning of that week, the um, SS force weren't operational, but by the end of the week, there was one regiment. They didn't get all their missiles into Cuba. Yes. Some were turned back by the quarantine. But uh, by the end of the week, by the Friday, they had one regiment with eight SS fours, each with a one megaton warhead right. uh, ready to go. And the others were all uh, operational except for the fact that the warheads had not been delivered to those actual launch sites. And Scott, there was this incident with uh, another fact we didn't know, the Soviet subs that were escorting the fight, the fr freighters with the missile parts were armed with nuclear torpedoes. Correct. And how close did we come to their use? Uh, well, perhaps David can talk about that more authoritatively. Um, I would like to talk about a couple accidents on our side that, okay. that, that the president didn't know about as okay. well. Okay, uh, yeah, go, go, <laughs> and then strobe. Okay. Well, let me just, uh, when you have a large military operation with thousands of people and nuclear weapons are involved, it's so complicated that things are likely to go wrong. So I'll just tell two stories that I uncovered in my book, The Limits of Safety. On October 27th, the height of the crisis, the United States Air Force sent a U-2 pilot on a high air sampling mission to go north of the Soviet Union to get air samples to see if radioactive debris was in the air from Soviet above ground tests. He took a new route mm -hmm. and the Aurora Borealis took out and he came out and he mistook the stars. He was using just a sextant to try to navigate and found himself, thinking that he was coming back to Alaska, found himself flying into the Soviet Union and saw MiGs coming up below to try to shoot him down. I interviewed Charles Maltzby about this. He was scared to death. He ran out of fuel, flamed out, and had to glide, radioed for help. And back in Alaska, because it was the Cuban Missile Crisis and we were on a high state of alert, F-102As, U.S. interceptor aircraft, had been loaded up with nuclear weapons. And their job was to shoot down Soviet bombers if they attacked the United States. They are ordered to go up into the air to try to rescue Charles Mosby and the U-2 in case the MiGs try to shoot him down. So we have single pilot aircraft with an air-to-air -air nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. with the pilot having this as his only armament, going into the Bering Strait, hoping that they don't have to use it against a Soviet MiG. Now, fortunately, the U-2 gradually goes lower and lower, and the MiGs turn around when they hit international airspace and go back. The pilots land and escort him down to a base. When John F. Kennedy was told about this, he was initially really relieved, but that's an example of the kinds of things that he saw as going wrong, even if he doesn't order them. Mm -hmm. And there are many others as well. But David has the best of the Soviet incidents, or one of the Soviet incidents uh, that scared Khrushchev. Well, there, the, there are two, if I may. One, one was to do with the Soviet air defense. So uh, the U.S. was flying reconnaissance planes over Cuba during the whole week, and the uh, Soviet Union had deployed SA-2 or S-75 in Soviet terms uh, air defense. And um, one day, when uh, by the end of the week, when the rumors were that an invasion was coming or an air attack was very soon, uh, the battery commander uh, said, Here, there's a U-2 flying over Cuba. It's about to leave Cuban airspace. You know, it's gathering intelligence on our positions, and they're just about to attack us. Shouldn't we shoot it down? And he contacted the deputy commander of the group of Soviet forces in Cuba, 
The deputy commander couldn't reach the commander who was visiting some other units on the island and took the decision to shoot down the U-2, and that's what happened. Um, when Khrushchev learned about it, he was absolutely furious because he had given orders not to shoot down. And when that news reached Washington, there was great concern. Did this mean a change in Soviet policy? Or indeed, was it the Cubans who had done it? Had they seized control? That was the one that Khrushchev knew about. The one he didn't know about, but we learned about uh, only 10 or 15 years ago, was the so Soviet Union had sent four diesel-powered uh, submarines at the beginning of October to go to Cuba. And these couldn't travel very fast, and they had to come up to the surface to recharge their uh, engines. But each of these had one nuclear torpedo with a 10, 10 kiloton warhead. And one of these um, submarines, the B-59, was, was trapped by uh, I mean, US anti-submarine warfare uh, vessels, in fact, the USS Randolph aircraft carrier and a number of other um, uh, US uh, naval ships, and they were dropping practice depth charges and hand grenades as a signal to the submarine to surface. And the US had told the Soviet Union, had told the Soviet foreign ministry, this is what we're going to do to get your submarines to surface. But that had never reached the submarine commanders. So the submarine commander thought he was under attack. His communications with Moscow were very bad. He didn't know maybe war had started. So he said, and, and the conditions in the submarines were appalling. The heat was up at 100 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. They had very little water. And he, the commander of the submarine, kind of said, one day, according to one of his crew members, this is it, this is it. Get the torpedo ready, get the nuclear torpedo ready. We have to fire it. And um, fortunately, uh, his crew members persuaded him not to do it. But that, that was very close and, and he could have done it. There wasn't any, uh, there were no electronic locks or anything like that. He could have done it without an order from Moscow. So Strobe, we are real close to nuclear catastrophe. And the two leaders are playing the critical role here. They're getting lots of advice, but they're the ones making the decisions. When you look back on this crisis, what does this tell you about how important the, the individual is in, in managing a crisis like this? Does it matter who is at the helm? Joe, I'll, I'll take my best shot at that in just a sec. But uh, like uh, David and Scott, I do want to say something about the drills. And I'll promise to get back to 1962 real fast. But 43 years ago, 1969, uh, I was doing Russian studies at Oxford. And, um, but my heart was uh, in Palo Alto. I was courting a, uh, a sophomore in, um, in, Gro in Grove House. And I, I, <laughs> I conned my uh, thesis supervisor at, uh, at Oxford to let me do, go do some multi-archival research at the Hoover Institution. <laughs> I don't think I ever got near the stacks in the Hoover Institution, uh, but I was lucky enough to have uh, Harriet and Sid as both uh, facilitators and, to a limited extent, chaperones of a courtship that, uh, that did pay off. Uh, and uh, Sid, uh, in the decades since then, has helped me with virtually every attempt I've made to write a book uh, on these subjects. So it is just particularly gr gratifying for me to be part of this, uh, this company. I'm already learning new stuff uh, just from what uh, David and Scott have had to say. To go to your question, Joe, in uh, a very real, it, 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 it's a paradoxical answer, I think. I think we were essentially lucky to have that president of the United States and that uh, leader of the Soviet Union at that time. But as David in particular has already pointed out, on the Soviet side, we had a reckless guy uh, who, who engaged in a harebrained scheme, a phrase that was later used against him, not so much because he was foolish enough uh, to use nuclear weapons to try to put pressure on the United States, but because he got himself into a situation that he couldn't get out of with some degree of humiliation. However, the key point was that these two men, 
understood that it came with the jobs that they had in the Kremlin and in the White House to not let the situation get out of control and go to nuclear war. Now, I wouldn't uh, go so fancifully counterfactual as to say no matter who had been uh, in charge of the Kremlin, it would have come out that way. But it's worth remembering that moral monster that Joseph Stalin was, he knew that if this was after the test of Joe One, the first of the Soviet uh, atomic bombs to be tested, that if these weapons were used in war, it would be the end of civilization and perhaps the planet. Uh, Malenkov, who uh, was not exactly a moral angel himself or a great statesman, actually said uh, publicly essentially the same thing. And I would posit that every single president of the United States, uh, certainly, well, we can't, I guess, quite put Harry Truman into that category since he is the only leader to have uh, authorized the use of nuclear weapons. But it was when we were, that we were a monopolar world. We had the only weapons and we used them to end World War II. But once it became a nuclear bipolar world, I think every single leader in the two capitals uh, understood that at the end of the day, some way had to be found uh, not uh, to let the dynamics get out of control. Now, that doesn't mean that the dynamics couldn't have taken on uh, a, uh, have gone, gone in a direction that would have been impossible to control. In fact, I, uh, I think it's worth mentioning, that to the, adding on to the conversation we've already had about how, it w with retrospect and what we know from what's been released from archives, it was worse than we thought. There were tactical weapons, according to uh, Soviet documents that have rather recently been released, that remained on the island uh, into the beginning of December. Does that sound about right, David? Yes. So, yeah, 13 days but it was actually longer than that. And, and Castro raised holy hell about this thing. He wanted to keep them there. And it was a hard-fought battle in Moscow, uh, prevailed over by Khrushchev to say, we, precisely because Castro wants to have them there and would like, if possible, to use them, we got to get them out. Yeah, great. Uh, let's go. Uh, we're going to open up at some point so the standing room only crowd can ask questions of these panelists. But I got them for about 15 more minutes, so I'm going to pepper them with a few more uh, uh, questions. And if I don't ask you the question that gives the answer that you want to give, just just <laughs> just go ahead and give that answer. <laughs> but, uh, Sounds like Washington. It's a, it's a, or the debate later tonight. <laughs> That's right. But l l I want to get into the. the um, the role of deterrence here. About some, I want to let's move to sort of the lessons of, of this and the question of resolve and compromise. Right now on the pages of, or the website of Foreign Policy, there's a debate going on between Leslie Gelb and uh, Stephen Sestanovich about the real lesson of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Gelb says, this is the mistake that screwed up U.S. foreign policy for 50 years. We drew the wrong lesson. We, drew, we thought it was about going eyeball to eyeball and making the other guy blink. So it was about strength and threats and resolve, when in fact it was compromise that solved this crisis. That it was Kennedy secretly agreeing that to withdraw the U.S. medium-range nuclear missiles, the Jupiters, from Turkey, in exchange for Khrushchev withdrawing the medium-range nuclear missiles from Cuba. What, what do you make of this? Okay, Strobe. Let me start. just take a crack. I, 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 know, I know both of the debaters. I'm not referring to the ones later this evening, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, Les, Les Gelb and Steve Sosnovich. I come down on Steve Sosnovich's uh, okay. side. I, I, I've talked to uh, Les, and I think many of us in the room know him and revere him. Uh, one of the things I revere him for is that he, he loves to be contrarian. Uh, and I think he just goes a little too far on the Jupiter issue. Uh, I believe, and the two historians here will correct me if I'm wrong, that there is evidence that Khrushchev had actually already decided uh, to concede on this before uh, the Jupiter 
uh, gambit uh, was played. Uh, and my recollection from Khrushchev's memoirs uh, is that he didn't put a whole lot of importance in that. It's not as though that really turned the thing, because he knew, as we knew, and he knew that we knew, uh, that those uh, Jupiter missiles in Turkey were, uh, if not obsolete and obsolescent, would be coming out in due course. So it was kind of a phony concession. Mm -hmm. I think it really was existential deterrence in its, es in its purest form. Meaning? Me meaning that uh, never mind what the accompanying filigree, the diplomatic filigree would be, the core of the issue was that the Russians had done something which put the peace of the world at risk, and they were going to have to undo it in order to get the sword of Damocles from over our neck. David. No, I agree uh, very much uh, with that. Um, it, it is true that uh, Khrushchev had basically decided to uh, accept the deal without the Jupiters. When the news came uh, from uh, Dobrinin, the Soviet ambassador in Washington, in, into the meeting, uh, about his own, in, where the Politburo meeting, about his own conversation with Robert Kennedy, who and it was Kennedy who had conveyed to Dobrynin that yes, we will remove the Jupiters in a while, but this must be a private deal. It's a unilateral thing we're going to do. It's not. It's not a deal. But uh, from the, it's interesting from the Soviet point of view, the message from uh, Dobrynin. Uh, reporting what Robert Kennedy had said was, there's very little time. We're under great pressure to act. I'm not sure how long my brother can hold off action, and we're going to do this. And some of the Russian literature refers to this not as a huge concession, but as an ultimatum. And so what they realize, they know this is on the Sunday, the 28th, is they believe Kennedy is about to make a speech that evening, and they think he's about to announce an attack on, the, on Cuba. And that means they write the letter very quickly and broadcast it over Radio Moscow so that it gets to Washington before Kennedy can make the speech. So I, I agree. I think it was existential deterrence, the fear of a nuclear war that made uh, Khrushchev back down. Yeah, got, this it. argument that a compromise is important that Les Gelb calls um, you know, the, the real lesson, not the eyeball, the eyeball lesson. And Bart Bernstein, in a recent article, calls this, uh, you know, there's a myth of what he calls the finest hour interpretation. Compromise is important. I think it's one third true. So I actually agree with it because I think it wasn't just the Jupiter yeah. issue, it's that the United States pledged not to invade Cuba. Yeah. Which so we there was, already there tried was to do. an important aspect of, of compromise, which we had very reluctantly done and refused, had previously refused to do. But it's only one third of the story, because as David and Strobe just point out, he had all, Khrushchev had already made the decision when the news came in, and this maybe would help him save face and maybe persuade some others, but I think he had already made the decision. Indeed, he had told the Presidium before the message came in that we're going to have to do what Lenin did in 1918 in, with the Germans, accept okay. a, a peace that we don't want, retreat for the sake of long-term victory of communism. So he had already told them that and when the message came in. But there's one other thing that I think all the stories that we've been telling really help you understand Khrushchev's thinking that something's going wrong, that he can't control the dogs of war and the fog of war. Not only do you have this U-2 fly in, which he tells Kennedy, don't you know that we could have thought this was a bomber coming to attack us? Not only does the Soviet general shoot down a U-2, which he didn't want, but Castro yes. has just sent him a letter saying, I believe and we have intelligence that the Americans are about to attack. And I would like you to order a preemptive nuclear strike against the United States. So here's Nikita Khrushchev trying to figure out what's the right thing to do, bargaining as he would, getting every little bit that wanting to get more for this dangerous crisis. But I think he said enough is enough. I can't manage this crisis. I've got to get out of it. 
so, take command and control uh, of the of the missiles in Cuba. Do, w would it? Are we absolutely confident that an order would have had to come from the no. highest levels in Moscow? I don't think so. No, no. In fact, we know that it wouldn't have. Um, uh, that it wouldn't have been needed, certainly for the tactical nuclear weapons, uh, because, in fact, the initial instruction to the commander was, you know, use those as you see fit, um, but with, you, also with the medium-range missiles. Yeah. No, they, they could have done that without an order well, from once, Moscow. Once he issues the concession, in addition to the public saying that we're withdrawing the missiles, Khrushchev sends a, another message to the commander saying, yeah, no, don't, he, yeah, no, don't the, do anything now. Yeah, but it's just a, the initial message shows that it was possible. Yeah, no, absolutely. they do pull back. Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, hold on just a second. So we, uh, on one level, deterrence works. The threat of a global thermonuclear exchange causes Khrushchev to back down and withdraw. But deterrence didn't prevent him from putting the missiles in there in the first place. At, at the, the one... Soviet general says, at the time, we knew that the United States outnumbered us 17 to 1 on nuclear weapons. We had about 3,500. They had several hundred. I mean, it was really no contest. And yet, Khrushchev does this anyway. Why? What does that tell us about deterrence or its limits? Well, I, he thought he could get away with it. I mean, the word he liked to use was, Kennedy will have to swallow this. Um, so you unveil the missiles. They're there. And then, uh, I mean, the operation, I have to say, was extremely badly planned because in the first case, it relied on secrecy to be carried out. But in one case, uh, the chief Soviet military advisor to the Cuban government told Khrushchev, when Khrushchev asked him, can we you know, hide the missiles in Cuba? He said, hide the missiles? You couldn't even hide a chicken in Cuba. <laughs> And, and Khrushchev ignored that. And then when Che Guevara, who, who came to Moscow in, in the summer of 62, che Guevara was very skeptical about this whole operation. He said, well, what happens if they find out the missiles are there? And Khrushchev just said, oh, we'll send in the Baltic fleet. And anyway, our artillery men, are, you know, they're pretty good. They'll, they'll deal with it. In other words, he was not willing to consider what the consequences of a failure of the mission and of a key assumption in the mission was. I mean, Khrushchev's not the only person ever to have made this mistake, but in this case, it was a very serious, had very serious consequences. But in a way, there was a, after the fact, vindication of the principle of deterrence because Khrushchev, harebrained schemer that he was, uh, decided he would probe. And he probed and he discovered, yeah. whoops, yeah. big time, not gonna work, got a pullback, and his successors never made that particular mistake again. One more question on the crisis, and then I'm going to go to big lessons about this. A few months later, Kennedy goes to American University and gives this speech about nuclear disarmament, informed by the experience in the Cuban Missile Crisis, a, 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 something he was going to do anyway, or is this very, seminal very in a seminal moment in his thinking about what, what we have to do about these weapons? Scott. Well, I believe that the myth of the eyeball to eyeball and they blinked, that lesson was deliberately propagated by the Kennedy administration for political purposes at home. Mm -hmm. Indeed, Kennedy and some of his aides planted the story that Adlai Stevenson wanted to trade the Jupiter missiles, but we re restrained him. Uh, that would have been like Munich, and it was really the tough position. And it helped. It helped in November. But Kennedy, looking back at this, was really frightened. In November, right. There's, There's congressional, a congressional elections. election in November. This is happening a month before the congressional election, uh -huh. less than a month. Okay. So he wanted to ensure that the toughness approach that she had been tough and got the Soviets to back down was the right image and wanted to do it for domestic political reasons and for international credibility reasons. So the I two get intertwined. Would, would you guys agree that it incentivized both sides? One reason that the Soviets were prepared to enter into a process that started with the uh, limited test ban and then the threshold test ban, you know, all of the, you know, what has evolved into arms control today, 
coin a phrase. Uh, that really was uh, a joint realization on the part of the two nuclear superpowers that uh, they could, they had, the, the existence of these weapons had taken the most famous maxim of, of Clausewitz and turned it on its head. Uh, war could no longer be the pursuit of politics or policy by other means. In a nuclear age, policy and politics would have to be the conduct of war by other means, namely the Cold War. And that meant not just existential deterrence, it also meant regulating the size, the nature, and the deployment uh, of the weapons themselves. Yeah, David. Um, I think that this issue of jointness, of joint understanding, is actually very important in the crisis as well, because when you look at the correspondence between Kennedy and Khrushchev, uh, they are both completely clear that a nuclear war is just a catastrophe, as Kennedy called it, the final failure. And um, at some level, I think they knew that about each other. So um, there, that's part of the existential deterrence. Khrushchev does try. He puts himself in a position where he's afraid that um, the Hawks in the US will launch a strike, and then he'll be confronted with the choice of using nuclear weapons or not using them. And, and he obviously doesn't want to use them. But who knows what he controls? The local commanders might decide to. And so I think it, as a Soviet, as a US attack appears to them to be imminent, that's what they're getting from intelligence, that's what they're hearing from the Cubans, that's the message Bobby Kennedy sends, then he has to pull back. And that then, I agree, that after the, um, the crisis, again, that sense of a shared um, fate, as it were, begins to lead towards more regulation of, uh, uh, of arms, the, the search for arms control. But one important lesson they drew, when Khrushchev was removed from office a couple of years later, there was a kind of, there were many charges against him to do a domestic policy, but one in the foreign policy area was that he had taken the world to the brink of nuclear war three times. Um, once over Suez, once over Berlin, and once in Cuba. And they said, and which is, I think, uh, accurate, this adventure scared the hell out of the man who organized it, namely Khrushchev. And they said the concluding part of the party document was, okay, sometimes you have to kind of threaten the imperialists with force to sober them up. Um, I'm quoting Soviet language. But, but they said you should not base your foreign policy on constant military threats. Mm. And I think that, too, is an mm. important lesson to well, draw. That's a lesson that echoes today. Scott? I agree with both, of the, both David and Strobe on the importance that this pointed Kennedy and Khrushchev towards bilateral arms control. But it also, importantly, pointed them to the importance of reducing the spread of nuclear weapons to other countries. Because that before this, it wasn't clear whether we would share armaments with allies, it wasn't clear what kinds of legal instruments could be used. Kennedy is actually given a briefing uh, from the intelligence sources that unless we do something about arms control, yeah. by the late 70s, we're going to have up to 15, maybe even 20 nuclear armed states. Right, and there's still only four in the world at this point. The U.S., the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and France had just detonated. So that's it. Correct. Four countries. Correct. And so this leads to the eventual cooperation of the Soviet Union and the United States to help craft a non-proliferation treaty, which I think is still one of the most important arms control agreements, multilateral, multinational ones, with 189 members in it. Incidentally, one of the last states to sign the non-proliferation treaty agreeing that they will not seek to acquire nuclear weapons is Cuba which only signs it in 2002. Huh. Uh, I have a story about that uh, later on, if you would like. Uh, well, okay, David, very quickly, then I want to go to other lessons for today. The um, interesting thing is that when, after the crisis, uh, Castro asked, couldn't the tactical nuclear weapons stay in Cuba? Mikayan, who'd been sent to uh, 
do the very difficult job of negotiating you know, the kind of settlement of the crisis, said, oh, we have a secret law that uh, doesn't allow us to transfer nuclear weapons to any other state. This apparently is an invention uh, on his part, um, <laughs> but, but it was a very convenient one. Secret. A secret law, yes. I, I don't know what uh, Tino will think of a secret law. But, <laughs> but um, the, uh, so at, at one level, he's standing in the way of proliferation of nuclear weapons. The defense minister, Marshal Malinovsky, wanted to leave the nuclear weapons in Cuba, and the tactical nuclear weapons in Cuba, but in the hands of a Soviet contingent whereas what Castro was really proposing was, you know, hand them over to us. Excellent. Could, could this happen today? Could we get a Cuban missile crisis today? Scott, then Strobe. Sure. Um, I think we could get one today. Uh, you could imagine it occurring between India and Pakistan. Today, the Indian doctrine is that if we are attacked with a large-scale terrorist attack, we have the right to attack Pakistan, Pakistani soil, Pakistani terrorist bases, and potentially the Pakistani army. Pakistani doctrine is that if India does that, we have the option of using tactical nuclear weapons along the border to stop in the invasion. The Indian Doctrine is if a single weapon is used against Indian troops anywhere, even inside Pakistan, we will respond with a full-scale nuclear response against Pakistan. And they think of this as deterrence. Making this kind of threat will stop Pakistan from doing this in Absolutely. the first place. Absolutely. And yet, the Pakistanis say that the Indian doctrine is a bluff. Ah. They're not really going to do it. The Indians say the Pakistani doctrine is a bluff. And when two sides with nuclear weapons are engaged in a potential crisis, both sides thinking the others are likely to bluff, it's dangerous, yeah. very dangerous. Strobe, could this happen today? Is this also your question about the lesson for today? Is this the, uh, the wrapped into yes, the Yes, it is. Okay, well, so I'll, I'll hit, hit it in two parts. I completely agree with Scott uh, about the very specific uh, danger of uh, South Asia. I think it was Norman Cousins uh, back in the early 50s predicted that World War III would, would begin in or over the Vale of Kashmir. Uh, and that's a prophecy that uh, has all too much resonance uh, now. Uh, I spent or misspent a lot of 1999 and 2000 working with the Indians and the Pakistanis after the Indians had exploded uh, there we think mostly kind of sort of thermonuclear device in the Pokhran Desert, and then the Pakistanis uh, set off one of their own, uh, both demonstrating a capability that we'd known they'd had for a long time. And one of the most maddening things I heard from both sides, the Indians and the Pakistanis during that period, was that, wait a minute, you big boys, the Soviet Union and the United States, you had a Cold War that went on for 50 years, you had mutual deterrence, uh, you kept the war from turning hot. We're big boys. We can do the same. Well, the two comebacks to that are, first of all, we damn near didn't keep it uh, a Cold War, as, we, as this whole discussion uh, underscores. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of luck. And by the way, we didn't have a common border, not to mention a disputed border, not to mention having already been to war four times, which is the case uh, of the Indians uh, and, the, and the Pakistanis. And uh, at some point uh, during the course of the discussion, I suspect the word Iran will come up. And one reason that's so dangerous is, uh, as Joe pointed out, the nonproliferation treaty, well, the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred at a time when there were only four nuclear powers. By the time the nonproliferation treaty went into effect, there were five because China had joined them. And since then, there are another four which is to say the presumptive but indisputed uh, capability of Israel, uh, India, Pakistan, and North Korea. And God knows what the world will look like and what the dangers will be and where a, uh, a Cuban missile crisis type problem could come. 
It could come in Latin America, for all we know, if, uh, if Iran uh, triggers uh, proliferation in the greater Middle East and you have five or six new, uh, new uh, uh, nuclear powers there. So I would just say that the symposia that are taking place all over the United States today, and I hope there's some in Russia, it would be nice if there were a couple in Cuba, uh, were to go global. Everybody in the world needs to know how close run a thing this was and how much uh, dumb luck or a, a kind God had to do with the way it turned out it did. Excellent. We're going to open up for questions from the audience. And while they're getting their, well, I guess their hands are already up. Uh, are, there, are there mics? Because if, if we don't have the mics, I'm gonna, Scott's going to tell his Cuba story. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll leave it to you. You, you pick. Hello, my name is George Malkin. I'm a senior. Thank you very much for coming to speak with us. Uh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Talbot, I'm actually a Hotchkiss alum, so it's good, to, uh, good that you came out to visit us. And um, my question concerns non-nuclear weapon states acquiring nuclear weapons. I would like to know what gives the right of nuclear weapon states within the MPT to tell non-nuclear weapon states outside the MPT that they can't have nuclear weapons and also to the states within the MPT, but specifically those who aren't. And do we actually have legitimate means to deter these non-nuclear weapon states from acquiring nuclear weapons if they are really determined to do so? Maybe looking at North Korea as an example. They're all looking at you, Scott. Um, well, with respect to countries that are outside the treaty, there is no legal right to, you can try to persuade them not to acquire. But if they're outside the treaty, they don't have a legal, you don't have a legal case to say. Uh, you just have a political argument to make. If you're in the treaty, however, Article uh, 4 of the treaty says that nothing in this treaty shall uh, inhibit the inalienable right of all members of the treaty to acquire the peaceful benefits of nuclear power comma, contingent upon their following Articles 1 and 2 of the NPT, which says for Article 2 that you're not going to seek to acquire nuclear weapons. Now, Iran will often use that first half of that phrase. We have an inalienable right, like the Declaration of Independence, um, the, the natural law. Um, Albert Wolster once quipped, the great Rand strategist, University of Chicago strategist, it's as if the NPT gives someone uh, the right to, um, uh, to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of plutonium. Mm. Um, but the important point is that it is contingent upon not seeking to acquire nuclear weapons. And the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency's job, the UN watchdog agency's job, is to tell the international community, can we reliably state that our safeguard inspectors can guarantee that this country is not pursuing nuclear weapons. And on more than one occasion, the IAEA has gone and said, we cannot guarantee this because but the Iranians have done some suspicious testing. We've seen some things, and they will not let us interview the scientists. They won't let us go to some of the places. So I believe that Iran has at least temporarily lost its right to even pursue the peaceful use of nuclear power until the IAEA can guarantee that they're not pursuing nuclear weapons. So I think we do have a legal right to say that this is wrong, and that's why the UN sanctions and US sanctions, I think, are appropriate. There's, there's one other very important part of the NPT that unfortunately is, um, is uh, observed in the breach, as it were. And that is that it puts an onus uh, on the nuclear haves, the five uh, nuclear weapon states that are permitted under the NPT to reduce and ultimately eliminate their own nuclear arsenals. Uh, and that is a obligation uh, which wasn't uh, taken terribly seriously at the time. It was sort of put in there um, well, I, I think in the minds of some uh, as a SOP, but it ought to be taken uh, seriously and has been taken seriously uh, since, uh, particularly during uh, 
the, the Reagan administration and President Reagan's uh, determination uh, to do two things. One was to significantly reduce, not just limit, but to reduce the number of uh, weapons in the Soviet and American arsenals. That's how SALT, where the L stood for limitation, became START, with R standing for reduce. And President Reagan and others, including uh, President Obama, have endorsed uh, the vision of a nuclear-free world. But until the rest of the world sees more progress in the nuclear halves, uh, living up to that obligation, I think it's going to be harder to hold the NPT in place. Qu quickly, David, and then we have a lot of other hands. Just one point. Um, of course, the IAEA can re report on what it finds about a particular state and its nuclear program. But on any issue relating to international peace and security, it has to refer it to the Security Council. So the Security Council, so the IAEA can't enforce um, uh, it, the NPT. So it's the Security Council uh, that has to act, and that has great disadvantages uh, if you have a disagreement on what to do, uh, advantages if you can agree on what to do because it gives legitimacy, which was part of your question, to any action that's undertaken. Other questions? Uh, I have a question um, from a Ustream viewer, Carla Thorson who ask, is there any evidence that Khrushchev saw the deployment of missiles as a demonstration of Soviet power intended to counteract challenges from the other parts of the Soviet world, in particular China? Hmm. So is this a bank shot, David? Was he putting the hmm. missiles in Cuba in order to influence <laughs> other communist rivals? I, I, it, that may have been a factor. It's very hard to figure out. It, I, um, but uh, if it was, I think it was way down the list of priorities. Uh, and the Chinese did accuse him of adventurism for putting the missiles into Cuba and capitulationism for taking them out. <laughs> so what you make of that, I'm not sure. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> so the, uh, you. I'm fascinated by personalities that made the decisions on both sides. I think we are lucky that the leaders on both sides did in fact come to the conclusions they did. They had advisors, I'm sure, on both sides, certainly on our side, that recommended much more aggressive type of responses. How lucky we were that these advisors were not in positions of decision making. So isn't there one of the great concerns that we should have is basically the leaders mm. that make these decisions every day and every year. Could I have some examples of some of the advice that they were given that they rejected? Uh, well, certainly the United States Joint Chiefs on the last few days of the crisis and who recommended... Was chair, who was chairman then? Chairman was Maxwell Taylor. Um, Curtis LeMay is the chief of staff of, of the Air Force, um, and they recommend an attack by Monday, the next day. So this is what Bobby Kennedy is hinting at when he's telling the, um, the Soviet ambassador to Brennan that I'm not sure how long my brother can hold out. Um, as I mentioned before, Kennedy was taping all of this. And when he left the room after the Joint Chiefs had made a recommendation, and to give you a sense of, of what he was facing, let me read what General David Shoup, the uh, commander, commandant of the, of the Marine Corps, said to Curtis LeMay. You pulled the, right, the rug right out of him, goddamn. LeMay, what do you mean? Shoop, I agree with your answer. Agree 100%, 100%. He, President Kennedy, finally got around to that word escalation. It's the only goddamn thing that's the whole trick. You can't do the goddamn thing piecemeal. That's our problem. Go in there and friggin' around with the missiles, you're screwed. Go in there friggin' around with the lift, you're screwed. You're screwed, screwed, screwed. Some goddamn thing, some way, and either they got to do the son of a bitch and do it right and stop frigging around. You can't fuck around and go out and take out a missile. If you want to do it, you can't fiddle around and take out a missile. You got to can't fiddle around with the SAM sites. You go in there and take out the goddamn thing that's going to stop you from doing your job. So Stanley Kubrick wrote that? 
if you did this in Dr. Strangelove, you'd say is acting over the top. <laughs> exactly. Huh? But this okay. is okay. what is secretly happening inside wow. the Joint Chiefs wow. 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 with the desire that don't, if you're going to attack, go in big. Be decisive. Anything yeah. other than a decisive attack, anything other than these 700 sorties, is going to risk American lives. Now, the salty language aside, that is not an unusual position for military people to take. Then? Yes. I, I was just going to bring in a civilian uh, counselor to the president. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm reading Robert Caro's latest uh, volume in his biography of, of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, my aspiration is to finish it before the next volume comes out. <laughs> but I've, I've gotten as far as the, uh, as the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I know that there are lots and lots of different versions of what went on in the XCOM and so forth and so on. And uh, Scott and David uh, know the, the details of that much better than I. But what strikes me about Caro's account of that is that when the president was not in the room and the XCOM was meeting among itself and Johnson was in there, he was hard as nails. Uh, he probably used similar language, uh, by the way. His, he was pretty salty himself. Very, very tough. And basically said, this is all about going in there and just showing them. Now, when he was with the president, he, uh, or the president was in the room with the XCOM, the executive committee that was advising him, which was all over the lot, changing their individual and collective positions all the time, Johnson was silent. But not when he was uh, talking to the other advisors. Maybe one of you has a better sense of that. David, add? Uh, on, well, on the Soviet side, there wasn't the same kind of debate and discussion at all. Uh, the, when uh, Khrushchev came up with the idea, he discussed it with his closest kind of colleague on the Politburo, and that was Mikhayan. Mikhayan thought it was a very bad idea, but he putting didn't. Putting the missiles in Cuba. Putting the missiles in Cuba, but he didn't s feel he could say to Khrushchev, oh, you shouldn't do that. He would say, well, have you thought of this? <laughs> and then he says, well, he thought, oh, when, when Khrushchev suggests this to the military, they'll say no. <laughs> well, they didn't say no. In fact, they were quite pleased, I think. And then Mikhayan thought to himself, but Castro will never agree. But then Castro agreed. And so he, had, he said no. then, I had to vote for it. Ah. So it's a completely different style of, of decision making. It was, Khrushchev was making the running. That was what a dictatorship is, is about. Secretary Schultz. It's interesting in this account that the advisors were more militant than the leader. Mm. And twice President Eisenhower was urged to use nuclear weapons by all his military and civilian advisors, and he said no. It was clear to me, you mentioned the Reagan period, that the uh, advisors around were much more pro-nuclear than President Reagan was. And I wonder if there's something you could reflect on. If you're the leader, you have the ultimate responsibility. And people can give you all kinds of advice, but they don't have responsibility. They can play games, but you can't play games. Could you reflect a little on the difference between being an advisor and being the leader? Wow. That's great. Any comments before we go to the next question? Yes. Go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, yes. No, no, no. Yes, that's true. I mean, you know, uh, you've got a guy behind, you're president of the United States, and you've got a guy who follows you around with a briefcase, with codes, and I think sort of almost ex officio, uh, a president of the United States. Let's hope any president of the United States uh, would... Uh, would, would vindicate uh, what you just said, Secretary Schultz. I think you're absolutely right. And I think a version of that has been true on the Russian side as well. I got a gentleman over here, and then we'll go to the gentleman over there with his gray sweater. Uh, hi, my name is David Cohen. I write for The Diplomat Magazine. Um, no, I'm sorry, you work for what? Uh, the Diplomat Magazine. Great. Um, I wanted to ask, um, could the U.S. Could the U.S. have tolerated uh, missiles in Cuba? Was Kennedy's judgment right? Mm. Mm. So was that a possible compromise? Was that just, okay, they're there, let's no. leave them there? No. Why not? I think, uh, among other things, uh, the, the, the Castro factor, this whole issue of who 
that David was speaking to a, a moment ago. In fact, I, th I think I remember at some point, it might have been something you wrote, unless you tell me it's wrong, in which case it wasn't in something you wrote, <laughs> that uh, it was down to the level of uh, a colonel or even a lieutenant colonel who could have uh, pressed a button with regard to the tactical nuclear, nuclear yeah. weapons. It would have been absolutely right. Right. unsupportable. There, there were these, what they called land attack missiles. Those are the ones you're talking about. These were short range nuclear armed missiles that could be used in the case of, uh, to U.S. forces off the coast. And those are the ones that had tactical command and control. Now, which, which doesn't necessarily mean, like we get back in the, in the realm of counterfactuals here, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that had we been faced with yeah. the refusal of the Russians to remove those missiles, there would have been a nuclear war. Uh, among other things, we could have uh, used conventional forces to completely uh, neutralize uh, the entire Russian and Cuban military uh, facilities uh, on the island. And then the question would have become, would the Russians have launched uh, their, miss their intercontinental missiles at us, knowing that despite, of course, the phrase that helped get Kennedy elected in 1960, that there was a missile gap and we were on the losing end of it, uh, they, the Russians would have had to calculate uh, that we had much more uh, capability than they did, and they might have stopped there. But I just thank God we didn't have to go down that road. But I do not think it was a live option to leave the missiles on the island. Okay. I agree with Strobe 100 percent. Indeed, President Kennedy, right in the middle of the crisis, yeah. when contemplating the risk that he knew he was taking, told his brother that if I didn't do this, I think I would have been impeached. And I think he's probably right. Yeah. That is, not doing anything would have created such a problem in the United States for many reasons that it was not something that was a viable option. And, and by the way, just looking ahead to the, what, what we're going to be watching on television tonight, a president, a re-elected President Obama or an elected uh, President Romney may fa face a, uh, a challenge, a dilemma, a paradox, an agonizing decision along these lines with regard to Iran at some point. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Over there. Uh, hold that microphone, Professor Drell. Let me recognize this man standing up. So thank you. Um, well, you've been discussing the question I was going to ask, which is more on, on the psychology of the leader and the pressure he may be under from his advisors. And I think this seems crucial. Um, the, the statement was made that Bobby Kennedy said, you know, told the Russians, you know, for effect or whatever, that I don't know how long I can keep the generals at bay. But I mean, is this, is there, is there, did, did Kennedy really feel the pressure that the generals would what? I mean, they have no, act, they have no authority over him, unless they're going to have a coup. Uh, and in t I, I have the sense all the time in, in today's environment that uh, our president. Um, feels the constraints of internal pressures. And I'm interested in the, the degree to which you think that he is prevented from doing what he thinks is obviously necessary by his fear, not of the enemy, but of his, 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 his advisors or his political enemies. And, and that is a huge question because it seems it's, it's always in play. Got it. Thank you. Anyone? <laughs> David. I, I think this is, uh, first of all, we shouldn't necessarily take what Bobby Kennedy say absolutely at face, at, what he said at face value, because Kennedy was plotting other strategies for avoiding a decision to launch an airstrike uh, to be followed by an invasion. For example, through the UN, getting Dean Rusk to contact uh, Andrew Cordier at Columbia, who had been a, uh, uh, an undersecretary at the UN to talk to Utant, suggesting that Utant make a proposal by Wednesday that the missiles from Cuba and from Turkey be withdrawn. And that would, might make it easier for Kennedy to do, to do that publicly. So he was still searching for uh, a way out. Um, it's, uh, I, uh, but don't you think it's true that even presidents face these 
bureaucratic, oh, yeah. institutional, and political pressures that in some way constrain their options, and that sometimes it's up to those, the rest of us in civil society, to help co create the political space that allows the president to do what he actually wants to do? I, I think that's a, a constant problem in American politics and in many other countries. And it, when you think about, think about th that earlier problem of a commitment trap that I stated earlier often happens. If a president says that if something happens, I'm going to do it, yes. that adds to, to deterrent strength. It also, unfortunately, if the event happens anyway, puts pressure on him to follow through on his previous commitments. Yes. And that's the good and the bad side about making commitments and making threats. And Kennedy, I think, understood that after the crisis, not before the crisis. The last question goes to Sid Drell. In a way, this follows the most recent discussion and the inter interchange between George Schultz and uh, Strobe, who have both been in government at the highest level. I worry about the word planning. You cannot know what crisis you're going to reach. You're not going to know how much inaccurate information you have. You're not going to know where the communications uh, fail. But I have the impression, reading the White House tapes <clears throat> on the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, that the system was acting in a very uh, ad hoc manner. It wasn't like a, a, a group of people in the XCOM and enlarged who had prepared for how to deal with a question like this. And, and, and as I say, they couldn't make a plan but they could have had some planning of how they would address the question and work out an answer. And so I'm asking, uh, do you see uh, in your experience in government since then that we do any planning for emergencies better where we have to make life and death decisions with almost no uh, uh, time to spare? And how does this sort of augur well for or not for the Iranian case? Well, uh, maybe since I'm up here and we have to get a mic to Secretary Schultz, I'll go first. But uh, whatever he says, I agree with, even if it's different. <laughs> uh, he was at a much loftier level. He, he, was the t he was the top person in the State Department. I was only the highest ranking male uh, in the State Department. So, uh, My uh, experience with planning is, gives me limited faith in the utility of plans. There's a, there's a, uh, a bit of military uh, wisdom uh, that I think is more at the level of tactics and logistics than a grand strategy, but it has application to your, your question, and that is the map is not the territory. Um, in every single planning exercise I've ever been involved in when I was in government or in track two type stuff uh, when I was out of government, uh, as you play out the scenario in which you apply the plan, reality doesn't uh, cooperate. And you have to improvise. And when you improvise, as was clearly the case uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the really decisive factor is the degree of wisdom uh, that is brought to the improvisation as opposed to the implementation of the plan. Mm. Mm. I remember vividly when I was at President Eisenhower's Council of Economic Advisors, we used to have exercises and carry out a plan for if there's a, a threat, you go here and I go there and so on to keep the government going. Didn't go over very well with economists, but anyway, we did what we were told. And one day we were all assembled in the big room and who should appear but President Eisenhower. And he said, among other things, we are practicing a plan. You have to remember that if anything happens, the plan is worthless. <laughs> and if you try to follow it out, you get lost. It's just a point of departure because reality never really quite resembles what you might imagine it to do. But you do have to think. And, and the big thing, it seems to me, is to have a strategy so that you know where you're trying to go in an area and to realize that Things happen, and you have to move around tactically. But if you have a strategy, you, you have a better idea where you're going. And I think in this nuclear area, if somehow in our government 
we can maintain a strategy of trying to get rid of nuclear weapons. And all kinds of things come up that uh, you have to deal with. But nevertheless, if you've got that strategy out there, then you're better able to handle the things that come along. I want to join everybody in paying my respects to Sid. He's just a terrific colleague. I learned so much from him. That's just a pleasure to be around. Ah. His office happens to be sort of at the top of the stairs. I come up, and when his door is open, I go and sit down, and we shoot the bull for a little while. It's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, closing remarks from, from Scott or well, David? It seems to me that, um, that if you look back at the Cold War, um, I think we should acknowledge that nuclear weapons did have a deterrent effect. And yet, if we look today, it seems to me that the logic that we should try to maintain that in perpetuity is insane, that these risks are high. Thank goodness we ran them with success, but they're not something that you can do forever. Having nuclear weapons is like walking across um, thin ice. The fact that we did it once doesn't mean that you should do it very often. <laughs> and certainly doesn't mean that other countries should try to follow in our footsteps. David? Uh, I think our, um, the way in which we understand the Cuban Missile Crisis now is very different from the way we understood it, say, 40 years ago when it was this kind of clash between leaders. I think we have a much more Tolstoyan view of it. I mean, in the sense that the outcome is not determined by the leaders, but by events, by colonels who or Navy captains who decide not to fire their torpedo and so on. If he decided to, that would have changed things. So, um, but at the same time, I'm not a complete Tolstoyan because I do think that in this case, the leaders it was crucial that they both understood what a nuclear war would be and wanted to avoid that. No matter how much they wanted to manipulate the risk of war, uh, which I think uh, Khrushchev did, um, but he, 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 he saw you can't, you can't go too far uh, because if you go beyond a certain stage, it is out of control. There may be the Tolstoyan dynamic does take over. So we were lucky. I agree on the wisdom of leaders. Excellent. <laughs> well, it's just important. excellent remarks, excellent lessons, and I'm delighted that so many in the country and around the world are also drawing this lesson of the Cuban Missile Crisis, that whatever value these weapons may have had during the Cold War are now greatly outweighed by the liabilities they, they represent. We can do with far fewer and ultimately none at all. We are minutes away from debate. We are minutes into an extremely important ball game. I understand is being played somewhere in the neighborhood. So before I let you go, please, I want to extend my, my thanks once again to Stanford University, to CSAC, to Plowshares Fund for hosting this, for our three uh, troubadours here who have delighted us with their insights, and to the fourth member of the quartet, Secretary Schultz, who chimed in at just the right time. Thank you very much. Before we let you go, let me just share with you, we did have a plan tonight, uh, and the plan was to be out of here by 5.30 because uh, of the debate. Uh, and so I just want to personally thank Joe also as a terrific moderator, David, Scott, and Strobe. Uh, thank you for this fantastic event. It was a pleasure for CSAC to put on this event tonight. And let me just remind you, for those of you who have friends uh, who weren't able to be here, but who you think should really uh, witness the debate that we had here tonight and, and this terrific event, CSAC is going to stream this, and you'll be able to pick it up, uh, the video, on the CSAC website. And so please encourage them to do so. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and let's thank our panelists again. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.